Thank you, everyone, for the fascinating panel. And Heidi, in particular, when you mentioned really, you know, for the next five to 10 years for China, it's really how China could transition from a made in China kind of economic model to created in China. And I think it's really, really interesting to think about how UK could be a great inter international friend for China in this transition. And also, I, I found it really interesting when Professor Liu mentioned this term, Liu Wa, which basically literally, mean, literally means walk the kids. So instead of working the dog, you work the kids in China. But the difference is that when you work the dog, you don't expect to spend any money, but when you work your kid, you spend a lot of money. So here's a lot of monetization opportunities um, here, actually highlighted in the panel. And I was actually also thinking because the Chinese market for a lot of the really fascinating creative IP we're talking about, a lot of them are actually delivered through the immersive technology. And, but there's actually, I mean, VR in terms of cons the consumer market is relatively, uh, sort of new. And so for research, I think there's a lot to actually think about in terms of uh, what is the effect of VR actually have on children. Um, and also um, Joe Cassie, who's mentioned, John Cassie from Factory uh, 42 mentioned how we kind of can bring new technologies to China, but new technology needs constantly testing and we really need to sort of reflect audience needs in real time. And that could be challenging in China or it could be the, the other way around. They're just really waiting for an opportunity to actually fly to China, you know, and get the project actually started physically. And uh, uh, William Latham, Professor William Latham pointed out actually um, from his experience in working in China, setting up a couple of exhibitions so far, because um, he's basically, he's an art professor, but he does immersive VR experiences as well. And he has found a technical team in China has always been brilliant. And as uh, Joe, John Cassie pointed out, most Chinese people speak a lot better English than how English people speak Chinese. <laughs> so I'll give that credit to, um, to, to most Chinese people I met as well. So basically the technical team in China will be able to most of the time interact with you in English and accommodate lots of last minute changes, which I think most creatives you know, often experience that, uh, often have the need to have last minute changes as well. And, um, and Hali also mentioned Chinese uh, creative space is really rooted in our traditions. And but jo both Joe and Joe and William's work is really about how do we kind of reinvent this space and bring to use new technologies to kind of you know give a, a new way of telling maybe a traditional story, but telling it in very different formats. So I'm really, really excited. And um, but there are also challenges highlighted, for instance, there are time zone differences, international internet connection problems, and that's how we lost one of the panelists just now, unfortunately. Um, um, but there's also IP issues and quality controls, and very often we get lost in translation. And actually, even for UK partners who work with their UK partners, they get lost in translation. For instance, development could mean very different things for people from a very different backgrounds. So, you know, for me, I'm a programmer. Development means you know programming, and but for someone from the creative industry, it means something completely different. So all this will take time uh, to actually you know, and we need to spend time to understand each other and gradually we can build trust. And actually, um, well, if you're interested in continuing the discussion, please go to the session space where you can join uh, some of the speakers for a live Q&A session. And actually one of the points uh, that was highlighted in the session, I was thinking was really about understanding um, immersive technology and VR. And actually, I think the next session will, will actually highlight some of the, the issues. Um, I was fortunate enough to see a video presented by Diego yesterday. I was really fascinated. I think that's going to be, you know, the next big thing. Um, so I really look forward to our next session. So um, please stay here for our next panel discussion with the three panelists all working in the space of immersive technology but probably have very different interpretations of what exactly that really means, which is really interesting. So Dr. Paul Tennant is a assistant professor in mixed reality lab at the University of Nottingham, whose research centers on applications of mixed reality for the culture, heritage and performance sectors and bodily mixed reality design. And Dr. Diego Martinez Placencia recently moved to UCL Interaction Center, UCLIC, where he is a lecturer in multi-sensory interfaces. His ambition is to create multi, uh, multimodal interactive system that allows users to see, hear, and feel virtual 3D content, but without using additional devices, that is VR headsets or haptic gloves. And the session will be chaired by Dr. Robin Sloan, who is a senior lecturer in game design. He is also the program lead for game design and production 
and creative industry research team lead at Abitai University, Abitai, Abitai University in Dundee. Sorry for mispronouncing that, Scotland. Um, a bit more about Rubin, since he's the chair. He's previously a game developer with experience in both game art and post-production. And as an educator, Robin specializes in teaching visual design for games. This includes 3D modeling, 2D image creation and development in game engines. Robin's main research um, area is game nostalgia, visual design for games and character design and development. He is a co-I on the in-game creative industry clusters. He's also the PI of the AHRC funded project in Game International, which will connect UK game industry to Chinese academic and industry partners, such as Perfect World, which is one of the biggest game company in China, uh, with a focus on supporting UK developers to better understand production, publishing, and market in China. Over to you, Robin. Hi, everyone, and, and thank you, Sylvia, for the introduction. It was, it was a really nice introduction uh, to the panel. Uh, so this panel is all about evolving the state of the art uh, new production tools and processes in the making. Uh, and uh, as alluded to by Sylvia in the introduction and the general themes, I think, of, of the Creative China program overall, we're really focused on immersive uh, technologies and immersion more generally. So to give you an insight about what we're going to be talking about in this, in this panel, beyond the topic, our theme is going to be on the idea of immersion and connected experiences. So how can technologies of various uh, forms be used to support those experiences with a focus on, on, on immersion. So with that, we don't necessarily just mean specific technologies, particularly those technologies that have become perhaps synonymous by what we mean by immersive uh, or immersive tech, uh, but a, a wider myriad uh, of tech and approaches that are interactive, digital, physical and online, uh, different ways of connecting people with each other, with different sites uh, and with ideas more generally. And of course, all that's happening within the context of UK, China, uh, and academic industry collaboration. Uh, so before I go any further, what I'd like to do is invite uh, Paul and Diego just to have uh, a quick introduction of their UK China projects. And then after that, we'll move on to our, our panel discussion. Okay, uh, I guess I'll go first, given I was in the order. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm Paul, uh, and uh, as, as Sylvia said, I'm an assistant professor at the Mixed Reality Lab in Nottingham. Um, and uh, I focus primarily on yeah, applications of immersive tech in, um, in cultural heritage and performance. Um, and generally, I'm, I'm kind of interested in broader perspectives on what immersion means when thinking about technology. Um, how does that relate to our China project? So I'm, an, I'm a co-I on Shaping the Connected Museum, um, which is specifically about actually connecting UK and Chinese museums and exploring what it means to connect two museums, whether that is uh, uh, kind of a very practical level of allowing people to literally share the same virtual space, whether that's at a, a kind of cultural level of sharing collections with each other, um, whether that's at a, a kind of logistical level of learning about each other's approaches to our collections. Um, so we're still very much exploring um, what it means to be connected museums. Um, and obviously one of the approaches to doing that is to apply various different immersive technologies. Um, and that's kind of where I come in. Um, you probably just heard John Casey talk as well, who's also part of that project. So you probably know more about it now than I do. <laughs> Great. Um, well, uh, I am uh, Diego Martinez. Uh, I'm a lecturer at UCL. And during my time as a researcher, I think so. I started working on uh, VR uh, actually some years ago. But over time, I've been moving on to different kind of display technologies and interactive technologies. And uh, as Sylvia was saying, just to allow us to get that level of immersion, but without having anything uh, uh, onto you. So over time, I've been working with lots of different display approaches from volumetric fox screens. And well, actually, one of the talks we are having later today, I'm going to be telling us about the, the last approach we are using, which is based on uh, acoustic levitation. We levitate matter in the middle of the air and move it very quickly as to reveal and color shapes so that you can actually see the stuff floating in the middle of the air. And uh, all of this, I mean, it, it's been quite a lot of fun. But uh, many of these prototypes actually have a complete lack of any kind of 
tools or any kind of processes that can help in developing uh, all of this. And this is actually something, and that's why I was really happy to uh, to join on to the panel because it, it doesn't really matter how appealing what you are proposing is. If you keep it in the lab, that's 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 not going to help anyone. So we really need to work together with industry. I'm super happy to be here today and just have uh, people from very different uh, backgrounds because we need everyone. We need public, we need industry, we need people who are generally interested into this uh, to get to know what we are doing, to sow it out and to, to just make it happen. And in the meanwhile, just start working on to all the middle steps and all those tools and technologies that we need to develop. So, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Diego and Paul. I think that, that gives a good introduction to what we're going to talk about today. And I think as a, a provocation to get us started in what I suspect might be quite a lively discussion, um, I wondered uh, if you were able to give us uh, some indication of what your perspectives are on, on immersion itself. I don't know if you want to start us off, Paul. Yeah, so this is a bit of a, a pet um, interest of mine. So I'm kind of intensely bothered by the way immersion has been kind of become synonymous with virtual reality. And particularly this term immersive tech really annoys me um, because it just seems to brush under the carpet, all the really interesting aspects of immersion, all really interesting aspects of immersive tech in favor of what's the currently available headset. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of VR. I really like VR. I spend a lot of time in it. I spend time even when I'm not working in VR. Um, but I don't think it's, it should be a kind of super set of immersion. It, it, it really irritates me because for me, immersion is about attention it's about something's ability to take all of our attention to the detriment of everything else right we used to talk about being immersed in a book or immersed in a play or immersed in a film and that's gone away now when we think about immersion we're talking about oh i have to be in a virtual world you don't have to be in a virtual world you can be in your own world you can be sucked into things um, and so i'm kind of interested in immersion from the perspective of okay when i engage with a museum What's immersive? If I'm sit, if I'm standing there staring at a spectacular Turner painting or a beautiful old um, piece of pottery, and I'm thinking about how that was made, and I've got I've got stories associated with that that I'm digging into. If I'm blocking out the rest of the world because I care about this one thing, that's me immersed in that thing. So, from my perspective, immersion is not about creating virtual worlds, but about creating ways of taking your attention, ways of forcing you to just focus on one thing at a time. Um, and there are lots of fabulous techs out there for doing that. So virtual reality, yeah, it's great. It does lots of lovely things. Augmented reality does lots of lovely things. You're going to see some amazing stuff from Diego in a little while, um, kind of his, his interpretation of immersive tech. So yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to go on too much about that particular uh, <laughs> hill to die on, but... <laughs> No, uh, so I was just here uh, listening to Paul, and I can I cannot agree more. Uh, you know, like um, uh, immersion is about that uh, suspension of disbelief, and you are just willing to join in to an experience. And as you were saying, it it has nothing to do with tech; it has all to do with with our mind and what we what we believe, what we are willing to believe. And it is obviously like a two-way uh, kind of a thing. You are, uh, you need to be engaged with the experience and be willing to give away some things to just take part onto that. We go from what we see in movies like Iron Man all the way to The Matrix. There is a long way to go on what we can call immersive. Yeah, I mean, this speaks to, to um, Milgram and Cuscino's um, reality scale where you have kind of real reality on one end, which is you're experiencing the physical and actual world at one end, and you have a kind of platonic virtual reality at the other end where all your senses are completely engaged. And the matrix is a good example of that. So you're, you completely believe and are completely immersed in uh, this, this virtual reality. And then somewhere in the middle, you've got augmented reality um, and augmented virtuality in these kind of different spaces along the, along the, the, the continuum. 
Um, and what I think is quite interesting is to, to push away from this assumption that to be immersed, you have to be at the far end, you have to be at the VR end of that continuum. I think you can be very immersed at any, at any point in there. And we should ask ourselves kind of, well, if we, if we are to kind of diverge from this, if we're to choose, kind of choose points on the scale that we're interested in, then what is the ultimate kind of evolution of that? So kind of augmented reality, I think um, Diego's showing quite some Iron Man there where there's this kind of beautiful interface that you can interact with and you can touch and feel and put your hand into and, and control in a very naturalistic way where the digital becomes part of your world. And this is kind of the idea of augmented reality is, is that you, know, you, you insert digital content into the physical world and in some way interact with it. But I think isn't the, the kind of platonic um, uh, augmented reality is that the, the digital is really is part of your world. You really can engage with it and it's indistinguishable from the physical. Um, you know, I, I would argue that the kind of Star Trek hol holograms which seem to have physical presence is a good example of that. This kind of digital content that really is properly embedded into the physical world. And that seems like a lovely goal to aim for, but also one that we're some way from um, in the same way, we're as far from we're as far from that as we are from the the, the matrix version of virtual reality, um, and I kind of like the idea of sitting back and thinking about well, okay, how can we get a bit closer to that? How do we? What kinds of technologies can we apply that will actually um, push us in those directions? If that's where we want to go, you know. But I think it's um, for me. There's a wider question of just because we can should we and what's the motivation for applying these technologies right it, it's all very well i mean if the cultural heritage industry is not the same as the entertainment industry and we shouldn't treat it the same as the entertainment industry right so the entertainment industry can absolutely kind of go here's an amazing technology here's a great story to tell with it go do things the cultural heritage industry i think is slightly different because we have to be more we have to be more aware of the stories we're telling. We have to be more aware of the risks associated with applying these, these types of technologies of, of overwriting history um, with, with new information. So I worked on a project um, fairly recently um, uh, about the Holocaust and what we were doing is we were looking at Holocaust photography and we were looking at the kind of stories people were trying to tell with Holocaust photography, um, looking at kind of what's the message in these photographs and one of the things we did was to create a, a kind of VR experience where you would go in to the point where a photograph was being taken and you'd be able to look around and look at what was not in this, what was not within the frame of the photograph. And we did a whole bunch of research with some historians to work out what else might have been there. Um, so who was the photographer? Who was out of frame? What else was going on in this location at the time? So as to get people to think about the context of why that photograph was was being taken and why it was being presented the way it was. And for me, that was a use of virtual reality that is about immersing you in, so partly it's about immersing you in the, the physical scene that you're going to, but it's also partly about immersing you in your relationship with photography, your relationship with particularly political photography in this case. Um, and, and therefore kind of subsequently immersing you in the other photographs that were in the same exhibition. So we were using, in that case, a piece of immersive technology to sensitize you to how you might then consider the other um, objects in the museum. And I thought that was quite an interesting use um, because it's, it's a kind of waterfall from a piece of, of so-called immersive technology that then kind of drives other aspects of the experience. Okay, yeah, I think that makes sense. And uh, I think uh, quite often we have these discussions about immersive. We, we do tend to fall into that uh, that continuum from VR to AR, as you've, you've both kind of highlighted. Um, but it's clear it is more than these just two ideal platforms. So speaking from my, my own background as a, as a, a designer slash developer in the entertainment industry, I guess, I can kind of with one hat on understand exactly why you want to, to, to move towards the idea of VR and AR from a production point of view, because it's about understanding those processes, those pipelines to build things technically uh, in virtual reality and augmented reality. But uh, building on what you said there, Paul, 
is there, is there something more to be said about the creative production processes? It's not just a technical execution, but more understanding what are the best creative production processes for building an experience rather than executing something technically. So I, uh, I think there are also uh, other aspects to maybe to take into account because we, we are always falling back to this uh, continuum between VR and AR and uh, all of that. While, and it's a bit, uh, you, you both have been touching on that, you know, but uh, depending on, the, on what your purpose is, if it is like engaging, allowing people to understand those objects that they are seeing in the museum, uh, even the access that you are going to have in that public installation. Like I, I remember uh, Paul was working on these thresholds, kind of VR uh, uh, museum exhibition. I thought it was brilliant, you know? So for those who, who don't know the concept, I think Robin is going to be sharing some videos that you can then check uh, after the panel. So in threshold, they were using uh, VR headsets, but also uh, it was a completely empty white uh, uh, room in a museum, but it, st it still had the cabinets. So then while you were uh, wearing the headset, you could just walk around, look into the cabinets, and the content would be related to that exhibition. But then you could also walk to the windows, look through the window and see people. And it was, the, the ambient was like correlated to whatever the content of the exhibit was. And it was just so valuable because in a way, with the same exhibition room, you could tailor it to so many contents, you could tell so many different stories. And as an experience, I was not lucky enough to, to test it, you know, but just you touch something, it is there, like, I mean, that, that's quite fantastic. So it is not only the VR, it was, uh, and that's maybe just another point, but you've got to be clever on how you can exploit uh, those opportunities. But then, uh, some other work we were doing some time ago with the museum at Bristol, it was a very silly idea, but it worked really well for people, okay? We wanted to allow people who went to the museum to get to engage more with the objects, okay? And we were doing this just by using your reflection on a cabinet, okay? So if you get, uh, you, you imagine that this is the crystal in the cabinet, wherever you place your hand uh, outside the, the cabinet, you get a perfect reflection inside. So if there is an object over there and you move your hands, you feel that your hand is touching that object, okay? With that all of a sudden, we were creating buttons around the object that you could select. And in the background, we have another display that would pop up. And so like, this is a mask of whoever and whatever. It was really good. And then uh, we started playing, being a bit cheeky. Uh, so when you place your hand and you slice through an object, Okay, your reflection would also be inside the object. Okay, whatever we projected on your real hand, you would see it on your reflection. So we were using that to reveal the inside of the objects. And people, also people interacting like that, they wouldn't see that we were projecting on their hands. So they were amazed just to see that they were seeing like the inside of audience, like, what's going on? You know, and it was it was not the technology, it was that interplay of that space, the objects, it was really getting them to engage more. Uh, with with those objects they wanted to examine, and so it is. They were really getting a lot more engaged and getting I don't know, like a lot of a lot more of that experience. And at the same time, just walking around the, the the museum with people, like they could look, they could share. I don't know, like sometimes it's not just uh, VR versus AR, and like there is. There are so many opportunities you can exploit, but it is really, really hard. And the more you walk away from that, more established things, your processes really got to go flexible. You need to work closely with content curators, with the space. Like there are so many constraints, but that's when you can get all the value out of it. And it is, it is something that in the end it's to involve lots of perspectives, like from the technology, from the content. Uh, curators from artists, like we were getting input from artists that was like, I'd be, I, I don't know, like they would just throw you an idea and you'd be like, so we can actually do that, you know, like, it, it was fantastic. So it is, and it's in a space that, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very enjoyable to work into. I think just to, to kind of um, pick up on what Diego was saying there, I, I, I think um, 
so the example he was describing uh, with the reflections uh, and, and your your hand uh, in, a, in a vitrine where you'd be able to see your hand and interact with things um, I mean that so that draws on a on a famous illusion called Pepper's Ghost and what I think is wonderful and I, I think is coming out more and more is that the technologies that we're developing and working with um, particularly the the immersive technologies or the kind of projection mapping technologies or or these kind of world invading technologies are a real opportunity for presenting magic, both in the kind of, um, in the very practical sense of using knowledge from, you know, 200 years of, of magic to do things like what Diego has been doing, but to also taking advantage of the fact that once you start focusing people's attention on stuff, you can start messing with them in really interesting ways. So, I mean, the premise of almost all stage magic is that if you take somebody's attention away from what you're doing, then you can do anything and they won't notice. One of my colleagues, Joe Marshalls, quite does these wonderful talks where, where he'll be talking about magic and somehow over the course of the talk, he'll manage to make a teddy bear appear on the lectern and nobody's noticed it arriving. And it's, it's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. And I think yeah. there are some really cheap tricks that you get from doing you know, anything that requires somebody to put a headset on, right? You have now blindfolded that person. So you've now got their, you've absolutely got the ability to, to kind of um, create really interesting experiences and really inter interesting sensations for them. Um, one of my PhD students, is, uh, who's a, a theatre student, has just done a really interesting show where um, he brings people into a room and then they wear a VR headset and they watch a, uh, they, they watch a play um, in VR. And, and in the play, various things happen to the room that they're in. It starts off in the same room that they're in. And while they're watching that performance, he and his team go in and they rearrange the actual physical room that you're sitting in so that uh, it matches what the state of the room is at the end of the play so that when you take your headset off everything <laughs> changed around you as well and it's such a compelling experience there's something incredible about the fact that that the world outside you kind of maps to what's been happening in the digital world and it's just a really simple it's a really simple trick right you're just saying well these people are audio and video blind essentially um so we can do stuff with them um and i think that's really nice um, because to me, what it is, is a, is a thought about what senses people are using and what senses people are not using at any given time. Um, so Joe, who did the rabbit thing I was talking about earlier on, a uh, teddy bear thing I was talking about earlier on, um, I think it was a rabbit in real life. Um, we wrote a paper together last year called The Limitations of Reality, where we basically argued that we shouldn't really be designing based on virtual reality or augmented reality or augmented virtuality or any of that reality continuum at all. What we should really be doing is designing based on sense and sensation. So our, our argument was, don't think about, I've got an HTC Vive headset. Think about, I've got a piece of technology which is going to cover people's eyes and give them vision. It's going to cover people's ears and give them audio. And it's going to take up people's hands and allow you to have vibration in their hands, right? Because if you think about the senses rather than thinking about the uh, the specific technology, you can then start thinking, well, what other technologies can I apply here? So what other things can I do while those senses are busy? So um, Diego mentioned thresholds, which was a, yeah, it was a, a, a class of reality we call substitutional reality. Um, although I would just argue it was a museum experience. Uh, but in that case, what we were doing was we were kind of having a physical background and repainting that digitally so that everything you could see, you could touch and everything you could engage with was kind of there. And that wasn't driven by the technology because that was using passive haptics. That's just using props. Um, it was driven by a desire from the artist, Matt Collishaw, to have this, this world that felt real. Um, and we came to it from the perspective of senses. It does, it does remind me of uh, this quote from Arthur C. Clarke that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable uh, from magic. Okay, well, like he focuses quite on the tech. Uh, I, I think we got to focus on, on the whole of the uh, experience. And it is in that moment that the moment we know the technology, the more we know that like, uh, they already have their expectations of what to believe and what is possible. And uh, that exploiting those opportunities to actually surprise 
uh, participants, visitors, audiences, that's, that's invaluable. You know, that's when you totally break the mental scheme. And, and that's, I mean, it also, as we were talking a bit about that suspension of disbelief, you know, they need to be happy to tag along. You know, and to to and that happens. It, it is the same thing. In a, I mean, you go to a to a magic show, just like frowning and like you're not gonna enjoy it. You know, just roll with it. They they, they need to also want to help. Okay, but uh, those are yeah. I, I I can only agree. Like those are things that we got to look for, and we we got to take that broader perspective. It's not all on the headset. It's not all in the resolution frames. Like it, it is on understanding what you're gonna do. Um, what uh, for each decision you take, what other opportunities are you missing? And that's what was really brilliant about Threshold, you know, that you could just uh, have it there. I was like, it is, I, <laughs> this, I this, remember. This is, my, this is my fear is that if we, if we start with the technologies, if we start by saying, let's do stuff with virtual reality or let's stuff, do stuff with augmented reality, then we hugely limit ourselves. So uh, mm -hmm. we work in the mixed reality lab with lots and lots of artists. Um, and we do that on purpose because artists are very creative and come up with really interesting interesting ways of mostly breaking your technology. Um, and uh, one of the things I like to do when I first start working with artists is saying, okay, what do you want to do? Not not kind of what do you what do you want to work with or what technologies do you want to work with or what kind of um, uh, you know what do you want us to do for you? I I, I kind of say, what you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to make? What's the what's the experience here? Where are we going? And then I'll figure out kind of, okay, what are the technologies we can apply to make this start happening? And, and usually at some point I'll have to, you know, rein them in. <laughs> but it's always it much is, more fun to start with the vision. Um, it is also, many times you also discover so many things along the way. Like I was just thinking this was like a, an experience we created some years ago. It is, it is quite a, peculiar one okay so uh, we were using soap bubbles okay uh, soap bubbles filled with smoke by doing that we could detect them just with a depth camera connect and we could project stuff onto them okay you could get like floating bubbles just with stuff uh, onto them like i don't know little fairies and all of that it was our idea to try to appropriate the whole space around the users you know it was we already had that idea in mind like uh, that so when you deploy any exhibition in a public space, you can hit the the issue that uh, whenever we are in a public space, we are very aware of ourselves. I don't want to start waving in front of a screen and look silly trying to figure out how to do something, right? While with the bubble, it's something that just engages with your inner child. You know, you see, you get to pop it. Like now, another thing we were doing, we were add, uh, adding a part here side of the of the bubble that was like a little surprise you could pop it and you would get a fragrance that could connect to that content you were doing but so i, I was saying how you also discover things along the way i remember in one of the demos we were doing it at a, at a hotel it had like the most beautiful rugs super clean okay and it was one of these demos with investors that you go explain what you have and what you're doing and all of that and in that hotel the bubble stood uh, with the racks being so clean, they would bounce off the floor. They would roll onto the floor, you know? And we were already quite pleased with seeing all that. And all of a sudden, we had a kid coming into the room. Nobody had to explain to the kid, you know? The kid saw the bubbles, was like, bubbles! And just came in running, like, started smashing them. Some of them uh, grabbed the air again, like, the thing started projecting onto it. I was there standing, looking at the kid. And it was just beautiful, yeah. I didn't have to explain anything what it was all about, you know, it was just pure joy. And, and, and those are things you can only discover as you work with the technology. And I mean, from that point on, we actually started looking into getting wax for whenever we were having a demo, you know, because it was great. <laughs> but many of those opportunities, they only grow if you create that opportunity for them to come. And for us, it was like a, a very magical moment. There's something very beautiful about those ephemeral interfaces, I think. Um, you know, it's it's only there. It's only there in the moment. It's only there while the bubble exists. And when you pop it, it's gone. Yeah, there might be another one, but um, I think that's a, it's such a beautiful um, kind of uh, opportunity to to have very unique, very personal experience. This is your bubble. It's not anybody else's bubble. It's the one that I blew, or the one that was blown when I was there. And I, I think. Um, 
recalling some previous work we did was about waves. So we had a, a wave sensor on a pier down south in Hastings, um, and uh, it drove a series of kinetic sculptures, which um, made by Brendan Walker that uh, did did various things like stirring a cup of tea or dunking a biscuit. Um, it was all very kind of the, the, the sculptures were be sort of beautifully prosaic, and they were driven by this kind of you know this, the waves coming in and crashing on the pier. And one of the things that was really interesting about it was that it didn't do any recording, it didn't do any playback, it didn't do it didn't do any kind of you know history. If you wanted to see what it did, you had to be there. And if you wanted to know what happened to that biscuit if there was a storm, you had to go and look at that biscuit when there was actually a storm. So you really had to be there to see your own to see that the, the unique experience is happening. And, and I think there's there's a real opportunity, uh, and I think this probably speaks to some of Robin's research about worlds which are continuing on and keeping doing stuff that you have to you have to go there to experience. You have to see, you have to see the live show. You have to see the, the, the talk from that one person. It's not recorded. We're so used to everything being recorded and accessible after the event. That that ephemerality of those bubbles just makes me think of how wonderful it is to have those those one off opportunities to be the one that was there and to have some stories to tell about it. Yeah, I think that's really true. And uh, I mean, one thing I wanted to point out, uh, uh, be wanting to say here is that uh, obviously a, a both of uh, Paul's and Diego's works really hard to picture in your mind, right? So that there will be videos afterwards. But I think it just it's testament to the power of speech and imagination that through your miming. You're creating this immersive experiences for us, <laughs> which goes to show you it is about the idea and it is about the concept and it is about the storytelling. And and because uh, uh, I can totally picture uh, Diego's bubbles, for instance, <laughs> from through that. But it'd be good to see the video afterwards. One thing to go back a bit uh, to pick up on uh, it was this idea of this uh, 200 years of magic that you mentioned, Paul, and this idea that there's already sort of knowledge of creative processes and how to create a sense of immersion and I guess spectacle, uh, suspension of disbelief. And I'm wondering to bring this back into the idea of that we're part of the Creative China program and there are these collaborations. And of course, we're all kind of impacted in various ways by how this year has gone. Um, but do you see there within your projects, as I probably do within, within mine, um, this uh, one of the main opportunities here is this, this creative collaboration where uh, UK, China uh, industry partners, but academic partners and creatives more generally. Is it about bringing people together to explore this existing creative knowledge around immersion and, and explore ideas and content production? Do, 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 is that how you see your projects going, uh, going forward? I mean, for, you, for me, I really hope so. I mean, I, I think um, we're, we're not a project that's like uh, kind of the opposite from Diego's. We're not really a project that's presenting new technologies. So our project is more about, um, as I said earlier, it's about application of those, those technologies in order to deliver something interesting that is that is combining those two museums. So, and I'm really hoping that this is gonna be a great opportunity for, for Chinese creatives and UK creatives to work together. Um, so it, it's not just about the physical buildings of the museums, but it's an opportunity for, for 200 years of Chinese magic to combine with 200 years of UK magic and, and you know, 2000 years of, of Chinese history to combine with 2000 years of UK history. And let's let's think about where are the commonalities, but also where are the divergences? What's what have we not seen from from um, from those those kind of um, Chinese histories and Chinese techniques and Chinese ways of telling stories and Chinese ways of thinking about the world that that are different from in the UK and, and vice versa? You know, what what have we got to offer from from our our um, stories and our history and our magic that that hasn't been seen over there that, and if we can find you know is there a nowhere space this is both of those things or is it is it bringing one into the other I don't know the answer to that and I hope our project will explore answers to that um, but yeah I think it's an opportunity for creativity um, yeah. yeah I think I certainly see that uh, in relation to, to our project is it's also not necessarily about technology. Obviously, we're interested in technologies, particularly things such as cellular 5G and how, how that might evolve, how we do uh, play in public spaces, for instance, which obviously connects to both your projects as well. It's play that I'm most, most interested in. But certainly I see this opportunity for, I guess, a degree of, if we're talking about production tools, and I see them more as, as processes, creative processes, a way of disrupting those processes. 
So uh, I guess in my, our, our project in my background is games, which has a particular way of thinking about things. And there are uh, certain ways of doing cookie cutter type experiences you know, and replicating those experiences, which can, I guess, uh, inhibit creativity to an extent. But I see this huge opportunity here, not necessarily for just uh, exchanging new game immersive experiences between the UK and China, but actually disrupting the way we think about creating those experiences. Um, and in particular, uh, I guess I'm reflecting on it because I've been sat in this room for the best part of eight months staring at myself on the screen. But how, how do you connect people, um, uh, not only uh, to create uh, new experiences for audiences, and as you said, the challenges around that, uh, how, do you, how do you connect audiences in UK and China, but also development teams? Mm -hmm. so I don't know, Diego, do you want to add anything on, on that in terms of what you see as opportunities? Like our project is very peculiar in that sense. Yeah. You know, because like our te uh, our technology is uh, very novel, like was based on these particles moving at high speeds and whatever. And everything like the hardware we, we are partnering with uh, Ultralip, and luckily our hardware it is largely compatible, and we are working to make it compatible and whatever. But then the the whole uh, creation process, as, as I was saying at the beginning, we are lacking or we were lacking any tools to actually support this. And that just makes it a nightmare to work with anyone. Uh, so in the scope of this project, we are working with partners in Shanghai to create those content development tools. Like right now we have integrated like all our algorithms into Unity. Uh, you can, when you start thinking about the experience, you just bring in one of our levitators and you start plotting the kind of contents that uh, you want to display. So in that sense, we need to create uh, those tools. But then the challenge is also larger than that. And, and, and that was why I saw like uh, this partnership and this project as a great opportunity for us. Like uh, we are, uh, our goal is to use public exhibitions to showcase what we can do. And uh, why is that? It, it, it is not only, uh, obviously we are interested in as many people as we can to get to know what we can do. Uh, that's uh, it is a bit like what happened with Oculus, you know, uh, like VR had been there and had been waiting for an opportunity for so many years. And all of a sudden, this guy who had been playing with uh, headsets in his garage sets up a Kickstarter. Just he was trying to raise some 250k in the first in the first day. He had 700k, more than a million by by the third day, and just a few years later. Like that made it into industry, but the key point to me was that it was just that spark, that Kickstarter campaign, so that people had an interest. That there was that, that was appearing, and it was a clear message to industry. You know, there is interest, so there is money into this. That's what really pushed. And I mean, if you compare where we were just in 2012 and where we are now, that's been a huge development. So for us, exhibitions are a way of just engaging with people but also engaging with uh, industries to create these kind of opportunities. But if along the way, we don't work on to creating these tools, no one will want to jump onto our boat because like, okay, I can show you the most amazing video or whatever. It's like, okay, Diego, now who can create anything with this? It's like, like if there are no tools, if there are no processes, like you just cannot exploit it. So for us, we are working on tools. We are also working in co-creating with the guys at Shanghai just to get to understand what, what they need, you know, because I am I'm quite a nerdy type. I'm, I'm not, I'm by no means a, a, an artist. Even. <laughs> so you, you really need to create that engagement. And for me, the, like this opportunity to just work with, and it also totally pushes you outside of your zone of comfort. You need to engage with industries. You need to engage with people who are on the other side of the globe. Uh, with lots of different perspectives, like not only from our technical background, like even culture. So, it, 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 but that's that's how the opportunity can emerge. And for me, that was uh, like that's a bit of value. That sounds perfect. And I think we're we're almost out of time. I, I don't know if you wanted to have one last comment, Paul, just before we, we finish the session. Uh, for me, I think I mean we're only scratching the surface uh, of, of what we can do. And we haven't really talked about communication between people and how to deal with the fact that virtual museums seem empty all the time, uh, which is such an important thing to address. But uh, yeah, I think if there's any takeaway from this uh, and from looking at the different interfaces that, that I and 
Diego and Robin and, and everybody really around this conference have been creating, it's that this is nothing to what is going to be there in the future. We're just, we're only just, just starting to scratch the opportunities. Um, and, and it's going to be really exciting. And I, for one, am happy to be kind of involved in it. And uh, I think just following what Paul was saying, you know, we are just scratching uh, the surface, but we need to think uh, a bit beyond whatever the immediate technological solutions are uh, around. And I mean, I do hope uh, like you guys take a look at the videos that uh, Robin is going to, uh, to put over there, because there are many ways of approaching uh, this kind of a dream of creating immersive, engaging, magical uh, experiences. And I'm, I, I was really happy to be on this panel and engage with uh, all, the, all the people at Beyond, because we need everyone. We need everyone to be aware of what are the options. We need everyone. Uh, you also need to be aware of uh, what the challenges are, but you need to just know what's there to, to start thinking. And, 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 and that's the first step that we need to take. Thank you. And thank you both so much. I think that there's so much to this discussion that could go on forever. But that's that's a good point, I guess, to, to end and say that this discussion can continue. Uh, not forever, <laughs> but for at least another 30 minutes or so if you, if you want to join us in, in the Q&A. So uh, thank you, Diego. Thank you, Paul. I'm really looking forward to chatting to you more about your projects. Thank you.